cool. So today, picking up from last time, so we had a, a short lecture on uh, Green's theorem. The next place to go, we're, we're extending into more dimensions. So we've been playing with uh, space curves, right, integrating along arc length, and then looking at the applications of that with um, integrals in the plane. And Green's theorem was a nice relation between those two, right? A, a line integral on a boundary and the area of a region. And so what we're doing today is going up from space curves to parametric surfaces and areas. And so this is a way to parametrize a 3D object, which is obviously going to be of great importance to those of us going into engineering, um, whether it be electrical, mechanical, aeronautical. Um, to be able to represent a 3D shape with a parametric equation is, is pretty big. So I'll show you kind of the idea of where we're coming from and where we're going, and then we're going to start integrating on these things at the very end. And then these next few sections are going to be about integrals on surfaces. So if we're talking about fluid flow, right, or charge distributed um, through a screen on the surface of a wing, whatever it might be, these integrals are going to come to play and these theorems are going to come into play. So it's pretty cool. Um, so stick with it. Obviously, stop me if you have questions. So let's go ahead and remember uh, what a space curve looks like. It's a vector function based on a parameter t. It shoots out a position vector based on that kind of time scale. All right, this was a space curve. And one way you can think about this is that it took a kind of a t axis, a t parameter, 0, 1, 2, et cetera, and it bent it into some, you know, 3D. R of t. So it took that line, one dimensional, and bent it into something three dimensions, right? It took, it took t as an input parameter and gave me a three dimensional uh, structure. So and similarly, we can take a vector valued function. And the other way that we thought about that, sorry to back up. The other way we th thought about that is that um, R of t was like a pencil tip tracing out in space, right, based on time. And that gave us that, that curve, right? So now the idea is, what if we took that pencil and instead of just sketching out a line, we started shading in a surface, right, going back and forth, gave me some parameters in order to sketch out like a, a blanket or a, a wing or whatever, a sphere in space. How would we do that? Well, we'd actually just give it two parameters where our x-coordinate is a function of two parameters, u and v. y is a function of u and v. And z is a function of u and v. Now, why does that change things? This is what we call a parametric surface. It's based on parameters u and v. Well, what this thing's doing is taking some UV plane, don't need an arrow there, some UV plane, a 2D shape, and morphing it into, you know, some 3D thing. Some surface S from some region R. Okay, so like bending an axis into 3D, we're gonna take a, a plane that needs two coordinates and then bend that into uh, a surface in R3. So this goes from R2 to R3. One way you can think about it. So we're gonna take a little bit of time to visualize from the formula what this thing looks like as a surface, 
based on what we remember from chapter 12 and such. And then we'll uh, look at a few facts about these things and then look at applications like tangent planes and finding the surface area, which is pretty sweet. So first example here. So determine the surface given by this equation. So ui plus u cos v j plus u sine v k. So I'm gonna drive at this algebraically, and then we'll look at a different way to do it using what we call grid lines, kind of visualizing the, the traces of these things. So if we look at just how this is parametrized here, my x of u, v is u, y as a function of u, v is u cos v, and z is u sine v. You might see this u cos v, u sine v have an idea that something round is happening. Um, but here's a way we can kind of just manipulate these equations to do what we want. So if we see that, you know, I've got a cosine and a sine. So maybe if I think about, you know, y squared plus z squared would reduce to something nice because that'd be u squared cos v plus u squared sine squared v. which is really just u squared. Well, that's nice because we know that u is already given to us as our x coordinate, right? We know that this is really x squared. So what we've been able to do here is just what we call eliminate the parameters, right? Get rid of those extra parameters. We can just describe it in terms of x, y, and z. Because now I see, well, y squared plus z squared equals x squared. So y squared plus z squared equals x squared. And we know that this is what? This is a cone along the x-axis. Right. I don't need to sketch it. You guys can uh, visualize that. But So this is one way that you can get a sense of how a surface has been parametrized. You see it looks wildly different when we use the parametric representation than you know, just using x, y, and z, just using an equation. So from like a graphical perspective, what's happening is on some, you know, like UV plane, Got some 2D region D. And I've got some point here, and this is the point U naught, V naught. I'll even extend these through. So here's V naught. Maybe I'll make this one red. Make this one blue. Okay, so these kind of intersect at this point here. We're going to watch, you know, what happens to it as we move into R3. So the vector function assigns this point to some surface. Let's say it's doing something weird back there. And so here's my point with a, you know, that's being sketched out by the vector function, and this is r of u naught v naught.
And one way you can think about it is that, you know, your u trace, if you held u naught and let v vary, if you held u naught fixed and let v vary, it might look like a curve through the surface, right? And if you let um, u vary and you held your v constant, well, then I'd trace something like this. So the idea with that is you can think about when you're looking at a parametric equation like this one, if I hold u constant, fix it u naught, or make it 0, or make it 5, whatever, and I let v vary, what are those curve traces going to look like as v moves back and forth? And then look at it from the other perspective. If I hold v constant, and I let u vary, what's going to happen? So you can kind of get a sense from looking at this, you know, what would happen if you held just u constant fixed at 1, well, then this is going to be what? X coordinate of 1, Y is cos V, Z is sine V. So you're looking at a circle of radius 1, right? Um, and those cross sections are describing, well, it's this way, right? Out on the cone in the X direction, right? Plus and minus. And then you can do that by holding V constant and letting U vary what it's going to look like. Well, it's going to look like the line, uh, what Z equals X. It's going to be that constant um, or that identity, not identity, the uh, what the, the line of slope one is what I'm looking for going through the um, origin. So I'm going to show you what I'm talking about without my hands. I'm going to use uh, calc plot in a second and show you a little bit more clearly, for example, too. Hands can be very illustrative, but to a, there's certainly a ceiling on it in Calc 3. So if we're looking at something like this, vector function 2 plus sine v cos u for our x component, 2 plus sine v sine u for our y component, and u plus cos v for our z component. So I'll put this graph in the notes again. And let's think about while we're here, the grid lines, when we hold u constant, let v vary, and when we hold v constant and we let uh, u vary. I might even, I'll mark um, v with red here. And u with blue. Kind of just kind of pin in your mind uh, what's happening. So try to try to just think about what you imagine this will look like. You can even jot it down. You know what R U naught of V will look like. Cos U naught two plus sine V. Sine u naught, u naught plus cos v. So the u naught's fixed. So, you know, one way you can think about it is u is like zero or a fixed value. So this is really just looking like two plus sine v for my x and two plus sine v for my y. And then my z is cos v. 
So there's got to be a circle in some regard. Now my X and Y are both identical. Um, and then my Z is cosine. So it's, it's spinning in, in relation to the axes, but how that looks might be unclear. Um, since these two are equal, it's actually going to form up a 45 degree angle. But you'll see that it actually just spins around. So I'll, I'll just show you the graph now. Okay, so this is what this looks like. Maybe I can zoom in a little bit. So starting at the um, XZ plane here, you see that the cross sections, when we hold, um, when we hold U constant, and we just let V vary, what happens is you get these cross-sectional circles that, um, that twist around. And when you hold V constant and you let U vary, you can think of this as a scalar, this is a scalar, and then you've got cos U, sin U, and U. You might remember the look of that graph is the helix, right, that spins around uh, moving in the Z direction. So you've got these two things happening with the cross-sectional circles as the grid lines in one direction, and you can see them here on the graph, and in the other direction are the helixes moving up. And so it's kind of taken this UV plane that you see here and bent it into this tube that's spinning around. Okay. So this is one of the more complicated ones. Um, they can obviously get more complicated or less, but thinking about the grid lines in this way to produce the surface, it's not always necessary to visualize, and I say this a lot, but it can help um, offer a perspective on problem solving that you might not otherwise have uh, access to, right? So when you can, go for it. Otherwise, you can just chase it down algebraically. All right. Uh, questions on this surface here, on this graph? Shoot back here. And then again, you could think about it this way. Um, two plus sine V naught. So this whole thing would be like a constant times cos U. Two plus sine V naught, a constant times sine of U. All right, so there's my cos u, sine u, and then u plus cos v naught. Here's where we get the, you know, the helix from. All right. Okay, so that's just some helpful stuff on, again, what these things look like. So now we're going to move into hopefully kind of finding where the tangent plane comes from in vector form. So getting a vector equation for the tangent plane, which then we're going to want to use. Um, and you might already kind of be aware of, of what our tools usually are. If we want to scan this thing, we want to integrate across a surface, we're going to need a tangent plane to get in there and do the best approximation at each infinitesimal point on the surface, right? So that's kind of what we're driving at, is how do we integrate across these surfaces and, and, and why do parametric surfaces make it that much easier to do? Well, it's because they use vectors and vectors just simplify the problem of geometry immensely. That's the short answer. So class over. I'm just kidding. Uh, we have a lot to do, but that is a major point. So let's find a vector that represents the 
the plane that passes through point P naught with vector position vector R naught and contains two non parallel vectors. A and B. <laughs> yeah. So the idea here is we want to find a, a vector. I say vector function. Obviously can't represent a whole plane with just a vector, right? But a vector function uh, that represents the plane that passes through P naught, so just any point with some R naught and contains two non-parallel vectors. Um, the reason we want that is if we have two non-parallel vectors, what do you need for a for equation of a plane? We well, really only need one thing. You need a you need the normal vector, and then you need well you need a point. Right? It's just like a linear equation from pre-calc. You need a point in a line, or a point in a slope, for a line. So for a plane, you need the normal vector, and you need a single point. So we got p naught. That's just any point. And then how do we get the normal vector from a and b? Cross product, right? Cross product between two vectors gives you the normal vector. So we're going to do this in the general case here, and we'll sketch out how this looks. So if I have some, let's give ourselves some space here. So if I have some point P naught in space, and we're talking about the plane that contains two non-parallel vectors, so we can think about just scooting those vectors here. So here's vector A lying in the plane that contains P naught. And here's vector B. Actually, maybe I should do it this way, if you don't mind. We'll do A down here and B over here. So then any other point in the plane Let's say this, this point here, P, lies in the plane. How do we get to it in terms of P naught? Well, what we could do is just scale up A, call this U times A, scale up B, Call this V times the vector B. And then we can add them together to get that point, right? So here's VB, here's UA. So we can say that this any point P is a vector function of parameters u and v, where you take that initial position vector, right, which is really this p naught, and that's plus ua plus vb. So here we don't really, the, uh, the normal vector here is implied in this equation. This is a different way to write it. We're going to look at it later when it's explicitly used. But this is helpful in our generation of finding the tangent plane to a point later on. So any point in the plane is given by this guy here. So it's a nice 
Um, again, a different way to talk about points in a plane using vectors. It just simplifies things a lot. So that, again, may or may not be of some help, too, with your problem set and your, uh, your practice problems, rather. So here, now we're going to try to param look at one of the ways to parametrize a surface. There's a bunch of ways to do it. There's not a cookie-cutter way to get there, and I think you guys are used to that at this point, that problems are going to require some thought, uh, getting a little creative. But I'll show you how we think about a few of them. Right, given a, uh, a surface, we want to parametrize it. Again, ideas, depending on what we're trying to do, different forms are more helpful than others. Um, so what is this? Well, this is an elliptic paraboloid, right? Uh, opens along the x-axis. It's been shifted down by 10. Um, this is what we call the trivial parametrization. And why is it called trivial? Well, it's because since x is already expressed in terms of y and z, the variables act as those parameters. They're acting as my u and v. So this is a good situation. Whenever this happens, what we can do is say, well then, I'm going to let x be 5y squared minus 2z squared minus 10. Let y be given by y and z be given by z. If you really want to stick to, you know, using u and v for whatever reason to keep your formula simple, you could do it like this. y equals u, z equals v, something like this. But it's like why, you know, why make things more difficult? So we can get a vector function of parameters y and z that represent this. And so it becomes 5y squared minus 2z squared minus 10 for my i component, plus y j hat plus z k hat. And so now this is a way to represent this surface with a vector function. We have a lot more theorems about vector functions and things we can do with vector functions than we do with just a quadric surface or a given equation describing a, a surface. So this is nice. So if you, in general, if you have a equation that's already expressed in terms of two variables, you've got that trivial parametrization. And this works, you know, for if it's um, you know, y is a function of x and z, or z is a function of x and y, like we're, like we're used to. All right. We are cruising. Any questions so far? Okay. Not too bad. All right. So this next one's a little bit tougher, and that's why we're going to do it and um, you might see similar problems. So say parameterize All right, so here we can't really get away with the trivial parameterization like we did before. Um, you know, we could try solving but that's for one, but that's going to break it up into two, you know, half surfaces. 
Um, we see that this is a sphere though, and that's kind of the key. Um, because what we know is that this can be given, this can be represented differently in spherical coordinates. All right, so since we're going for a parameterization, it doesn't really matter. Um, well, I mean, it matters, but you are free to use whatever coordinate system describes the same surface. Okay, so if we have a sphere, why mess around with rectangular coordinates? Let's move to spherical, right, and see if that gets us anything. Um, so, we see that, you know, and this is not obvious, I'm just putting this in the notes, but this would take some contemplation. We see that, you know, rho is really square root of 30. And that describes this sphere, right, with um, theta and phi going through their full sweep. So then we know that our x, which is normally given in um, spherical by, um, did I say phi or rho? This is rho. Uh, so rho cos phi cos theta. No, no. Somebody stop me. He's gone. He's gone rogue. He's making up his own formulas. It's rho sine phi cos theta. Y equals rho sine phi sine theta. Z is rho um, cos phi. And so since we have this piece, since rho is fixed, we know that we've got this thing in terms of two parameters now, because we can just fix rho to radical 30. So we know x is really radical 30, all this stuff. So then we've got a two-parameter function for each of my uh, x, y, and z coordinates. So we can write our vector function as a function of phi and theta. Radical 30 sine phi cos theta i hat plus radical 30 sine phi sine theta uh, j hat plus radical 30 cos phi k hat. So we don't need to stick to rectangular coordinates. We can play with cylindrical. We can play with um, spherical as long as you have something to eliminate one of the variables. And again, it's gonna be highly contextual, but I show you these two examples to show you it can be super easy, or it can take a lot of thought. Um, it can take switching coordinate systems to do it. But once you do, it's not so bad. All right. So, Moving into the notion of tangent planes. You should already be familiar with why we care about tangent planes. Right? It's a way to zoom in on a surface. When you zoom in close enough to a surface, it looks like a plane. Right? It looks like a linear equation. Just like when you zoom in on a curve, it looks like a line. As long as things are nice, it's not the Cauchy Weierstrass function. As long as things are relatively well behaved, you zoom in on the surface, it'll look like a plane. So the best plane to approximate it at each point is the tangent plane. So obviously we want to be able to find that. So let's take a look at this from a geometric perspective. So let's say we've got some surface here. some blob out in space.
that's doing something like this. So here's my surface S. So again, if we come into this point here, P naught, and we, we know that this surface S has a vector representation. It's a function of two parameters, U and V. At this point, P naught here in the middle, The plane that's sitting right on top of that point or contains that point. What, um, what angle is it going to form with the surface? Well, if you look in just the U direction, right, taking that um, grid line across the surface, what would be the best uh, slope, since it's a curve now, to approximate the surface in that direction. If your answer is anything other than the derivative, you're wrong, right? So it's gotta be the, the partial derivative in that direction. That's the best approximate for the slope in that direction. And then likewise, so moving in the, uh, in the U direction here, this would be the partial derivative of R with respect to U. And in this direction, it would be the partial derivative of R with respect to V. The tangent plane has to contain both of those two vectors, right? If it didn't, it wouldn't be the closest approximation to the actual surface. So let's, let's jot that in, just because I don't think that the graph is super clear. You know, the tangent plane of here's P naught, this has to contain R, uh, we said V is that, that direction, has to contain RV and RU. And again, just to say it again from a different angle, what is R sub U? It's holding V constant. It's the derivative in that direction, right? Okay. So for this thing here, yeah. So this forms a little tiny plane with these two. So then, if we're given this, oh, I'm going to run out of room here. So for this parametric representation of the plane, the cross product of the two um, partial vectors, partial derivative vectors, is normal to the tangent plane. All right, again, how do we know that? Well, if this tangent plane contains R sub u and R sub v, then the vector that's normal to that plane is going to be the cross product of those two vectors. And the other piece that will come into play later is that for that little tiny wedge of the tangent plane, the magnitude of that cross product gives you the area of it, right? Remember how the area of the cross or the area of the parallelogram formed by the two vectors, that's the magnitude of the cross product. So that's going to come into play in a little bit. But let's look at, let's compute this uh, for an example first. Question? Okay.
All right. So what is this five? Example five. So let's say we're asked to find the equation of the tangent plane to S, the surface given by this guy here, ui hat plus 2v squared j hat plus u squared plus v k hat at the point 2, 2, 3. So what do we need for that? Well, we need a tangent plane. You remember the tangent plane is given by what? Well, it's well, we can write it a few ways. Z minus Z naught Right, remember this? So we need the uh, normal vector and we need the point that it's passing through. So let's say or Right, because this is not in a vector form. This is in its rectangular equation. But what we really need is the normal vector to the plane and the point. So to get the normal vector to the plane, we'll need what? The partial derivative in the u direction vector function and then the same in the v, and then we'll cross them to get the normal. And then we know the point already is 2, 2, 3. And then we'll be there, because then we, need, then we have what we need for, right, um, ax plus, well, going too fast here, ax minus a plus bx minus y minus b, plus c, z minus c equals d. Equals zero. Equals zero, yeah. So let's go ahead and find that. Well, how do we find the partial of this function with respect to u? You take the partial of each of the components with respect to u. So it's still a vector function, so it's really um, like this here. You know, it's dr. Oh, let's not do it like that. Just to be super clear. All right, so this is 1i hat plus 0j hat plus 2uk hat. So that's just i plus 2uk. So that's r sub u. So let you guys take a second and find r sub v. Partial with respect to V.
So we should just get four V J plus K. We've got this guy, we've got this guy. So to find that normal vector to the plane, we cross these two vectors. So we've got just the components here. So one, zero, and two U. And then zero, four, V, and one. It's not so bad because you have a couple zeros in there. But you should get negative eight U V I hat minus one J hat plus four V K hat. So that equals my normal vector. But this is given to me in terms of u and v, which is not a problem. But what are we looking for? We're looking for the equation of the tangent plane at a specific point, right? And the points given to us at 2, 2, 3. So the question is what u and v parameters get us there. Well, we go back to the original um, vector function, which is what u i hat plus 2 v squared j hat plus u squared plus v k hat. And we know that this needs to point to um, 2, 2, 3. So we just set up a quick system of equations. We see u equals 2 then. 2v squared must equal 2 as well. And then u squared plus v must equal 3. So u equals 2, that's fixed, that's good. 2v squared equals 2. This is going to tell me that v equals plus or minus 1, right? Um, so we get two possible values for v, which is not good because we're talking about a single point. But luckily we have a third equation, we can figure out which one um, checks out. So u squared plus v. This tells us that 2 squared uh, plus 1 does not equal 3, but 2 squared minus 1 does equal 3. So we just take v equals negative 1 and u equals 2. So... Again, why do we need that? Well, we need the normal vector that is oriented for that particular point. So that tells us that the normal vector n that we need is really negative 8 times u times v. So that's 2, negative 1, i. Where's my normal here? Minus j hat plus 4v. So v is negative 1, so that's a minus 4k hat, which is all 16i hat minus j hat minus 4k. So I've got my normal vector. I've got my point where I'm at. So This tangent plane must be given by 16x minus 2 minus y minus 2 uh, minus 4z minus 3 equals 0. So 
So nothing too crazy, but just kind of seeing how the pieces interlock here. Uh, so we'll take a moment to let you get that down. Again, kind of popping around, looking at different problems to give you different perspectives. Hopefully this is helpful. Uh, and any questions thus far? All right. All right. So a quick application while we're here. And again, this is going to be big for some theorems later. Is the um, areas of surfaces. Area is a geometry problem. Vectors make geometry easy. We should talk about surface area while we're here playing with parametric surfaces. So the area of a given surface, similar to when we we're finding the area of the region, let's actually do that before we look at this. Remember the area of you know, a region D was what? The double integral over D of just one DA, right? Well, here the area is going to be given by the double integral over D, which is the plane, right, the projection down from where this thing came from, there is that area element. But remember, this was parametrized. So we need the magnitude of those little parallelograms as we move around the surface based on your coordinates u and v. Okay, so as the pencil tip sketches around, it's kind of moving at a different speed, quote unquote, based on your parametric function. So that's that kind of corrector for the fact that it's not just a UV plane. This thing has, you know, it's either curved or it's got ripples or whatever, and this is going to account for that. So again, another little sketch to kind of remember that. Nope. here the area of this parallelogram is the magnitude of the cross product and this is you know r sub u and r sub v not Just keeping that U in, on the bottom so that we don't have to worry about the sign, because it is a signed area. So orientation is important to note. But that's what this little bit is, is it's, you know, if we're approximating the surface with these tiles, this is the area of the tile. So that's kind of the, um, the size as we scan around and then add those all up. And again, this is where r sub u is x sub u i hat. y sub u j hat, z sub u k hat. Because remember that x, y, and z are functions of u and v.
So without going into a whole, you know, Riemann sums argument, which you, we can, and that's what's at the core of this, obviously. Um, and that's what I had to do in Calc 3, but I'm sparing you all that. Uh, you guys kind of are familiar with the process, right? Break it into tiny discrete parts, infin infinitesimally small. Take the limit, sum them up, add up all those tiles. We'll get the total surface area across the whole thing. And it'll be exact if you can compute it exactly. So we're going to do a problem that highlights this. So we can use this to find the surface area. Of the portion. Of the sphere. Of radius four. That lies inside the cylinder. X squared plus Y squared equals 12. And above the XY plane. Or Z equals zero. All right, so to do this, we're going to need to be able to parametrize the sphere, find where they intersect, and then find a normal vector, right? Find that cross product, which then we can integrate with respect to. Okay. So again, since things are round here, moving to the um, moving to polar and or cylindrical is a good idea. So first we'll start off, we'll, you know, we want to parameterize things. So the sphere, we've already done this. A sphere of radius four equals, you know, four squared. We know how to do this with uh, phi and theta. We said, well, it's just really the radius sine phi cos theta i. Um, actually, I'm going to write it just in component form here. 4 cos phi. That's backwards. Sine phi sine theta and then for cos phi. So this is the sphere, the whole sphere. If we have, right, theta between zero and two pi. Now, if you think about this, this is the sphere sitting inside the cylinder. So it's like a golf ball inside a toilet paper tube, right? Um, if those things are similarly sized. And, and it's above the z-axis. So we're spinning all the way around this way, but how far we go down with phi is not the full rotation, right? It's not from 0 to 180. So the question is, where do they, where do they meet? So we know that we know that theta is good to go, um, but how about this parameter phi? Well, we want to find where the sphere and the cylinder intersect. To find that, to find the limits for phi. Why do we need the limits for phi? Well, we're integrating over this um, 
this two-dimensional region. So we need two sets of limits. We need zero to theta and we need zero to phi. And actually, let's write this in here while we're up here. You know, this is um, this area element. This is your uh, du dv, right? So obviously, your limits over here would have to be u and v. Okay. So we want to find where the sphere and the cylinder intersect. So let's think about it. The sphere Well, this is going to be where this equation, you know, it's normally equal to 16 the cylinder. It's really x squared plus y squared equals 12, right? And so if we take this and sub it into the sphere equation to see when they're equal, this is really, you know, 12 plus z squared equals 16. So then z squared is 4, so z is plus or minus 2. We know we're really only keeping the positive value, right? Because we're above the xy plane. So we know z equals 2, and this needs to equal rho cos phi. Well, we know the radius that rho is fixed at what? It's fixed at 4, because it's the sphere of radius 4. So 2 equals 4 cos phi, and this will help us find what we need for our phi angle. So phi is 60 degrees, pi over 3. So what does that mean? This means we have the limits for phi. It's between 0 and pi over 3. Why does this make sense? Well, let me see if I can do a really bad and fast sketch. We have a cylinder. And we have a sphere sitting inside it. Cylinder smaller, so the sphere kind of cuts over the top like this. All right, maybe I should do this in a different color. But where it meets is going to be this circle around. And oh, this is a terrible picture. <laughs> But it starts up here and ends here. And so we're talking about this angle for phi here. And that range is between 0 and 60. Does that help a little bit? OK. This perspective on the sphere is way off. It should cut around the back, but whatever. Um, so that's, that's phi. And you can drive at this totally algebraically, too. You don't need the, the sketch. So now that we have that, we've got our limits for integration, right? What are the three parts we need? Limits of integration, your area element, if there's a Jacobian, you need to deal with that, and then your integrand itself. Make sure it's all in terms of phi and theta. So for this, um, to find the area of S, it's a double integral over D, dA. Well, here we're talking about These two, this would be, you know, uh, d phi d theta. And so we know th uh, phi ranges between 0 and pi over 3, and theta goes between 0 and 2 pi. So we've got this part all set. This part's all set. Now we need this middle part. The, the magnitude of the area of those tiles, those parallelogram tiles that we're scooting along. 
So first we need, well, we can probably do this all in one shot if we really wanted to. All right, given our two, given our functions, let's plug in our function over here and we'll differentiate as we go. We'll do the partial derivatives. Okay, so long, this guy here is r sub theta, and this guy is r sub phi. So r sub theta is gonna be given by this here. So minus four, and we're not gonna do all this out because it's pretty gnarly but we'll write it, we'll write in the setup. Okay, so the derivative with respect to theta across the first row here, just because of the way we did this. And then with respect to phi, so before cos phi, cos theta. Or cos phi oops, sine theta and then negative four sine phi. And it's not even like it's hard, it's just a lot of bookkeeping. So we'll do that classic dot 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 maneuver right there. Let's say fill in the gaps later. Um you know, you do need to be able to do it, but we're not, we just don't have the time right now. So when all's said and done, sine squared V, sine theta J, minus 16, sine phi, cos phi, K. All right, now that's just a cross product. I didn't actually find the magnitude. The magnitude will work out to be nicer. Because that's going to be what? Well, you know, this piece squared plus this piece squared plus this piece squared. Another little dot, dot, dot situation because there's going to be a lot of just Pythagorean theorem, Pythagorean identities, rather. You can kind of yank out of there, get a nice square root, and it boils down pretty nicely to just 16 sine phi. Okay, so... Since that is in your integrand, you know that you need to integrate with respect to this first. And I mean, in the spherical world, you need to end with theta anyway. So this is fine. So this is our piece here. So now we're good to go. So now we know the area of S is gonna be given by the double integral, zero to two pi 
0 to pi over 3, where the cone and the sphere meet. 16 sine phi d phi d theta. Can remember this is your dA. This is normally your du dV or dV du. And this is a pretty easy double integral from here. So cosine at um, pi over 3 is a half. You get down to 8. d theta, which gets you 16 pi. So what did we just find? Surface area of you know, the sphere inside the cone, or sphere inside a cylinder, right? And as much work as that middle part is, it turns out to be a pretty nice integral. Um, obviously, spherical is the way to go with that one. All right, so that's a pretty long problem. Any need to backtrack, questions, anything there? All right, still having fun? Okay, good talk. All right. Let's keep going. Uh, I actually only have one more example. Yeah. So this will be this surface area will be kind of the primary thing I want you to focus on um, as well as this next part. And then uh, you'll be just identifying surfaces and playing with that stuff uh, over the weekend. All right. So one more example here. So and it's it's not even that different than what we've been working on. It's just a different perspective on it. So if we have a graph of a function of x and y, well, here we see that we can take that trivial parameterization for a vector function that normally looks like this. Now it's a, you know, function of x and y. So, when we take the partials, right, because if we're going to talk about the surface area of a graph, of a surface, then we're going to need those partials. So the partial derivative of this vector function becomes what? Well, derivative of x is just 1i. Derivative of y for yj is just 0, so that's 0j. Plus the der partial derivative of f of xy with respect to x. Well, that's just df dx, right? Um, so we could write it as df dx k. Everybody see how I got that? Middle, middle term dropped out because it didn't have any x's. And we see Come on, Mr. Pencil. It's like I have to sharpen a digital pencil that makes no sense, right? No sense. R sub y is so the x term has no y, so that's 0i plus 1j plus df dy for my k component. 
Okay, so these are my two tangent vectors in the x and y direction. So then when we go to compute that cross product that we'll need for the surface area, what's that going to look like? Not too bad. 1, 0, df dx, 0, 1, df dy. And so that cross product, that normal vector to the tangent plane at any point is negative df dx i minus negative df dy j plus k. Or you could think of it as, you know, f sub x i minus f sub y j plus k. So this is the cross product, but what we need is the magnitude of the cross product, because that's the what? That's the area of that little parallelogram by the two uh, tangent vectors. So it becomes the square root of this guy squared plus this guy squared plus this guy squared, these components. So that's df dx squared plus df dy squared plus 1 squared is just 1. Or another way to think about it is just using z, right? dz dx. Okay, so then that tells us that the area, oop, area of the surface described by f of x, y is then the double integral over d of the magnitude of that cross product, so that's 1 plus df dx squared plus df dy squared, all dA. So this sh should look somewhat familiar. You might remember the arc length formula, which was the integral over the interval a to b, 1 plus dy dx dx, right, as we scoot along the interval, getting the magnitude of the tangent vector as we move along. That's exactly what's happening here, except it's added one dimension. Instead of moving along a line, we're scooting along in this plane, and we're getting those areas, and we're adding those up. So this will give us the total area instead of the total length. So this is like a really good analogy for this, okay? Because we're zooming in as close as we can down to infinitesimals and, um, and adding up those, the area of those little tangent planes. All right, so let's use this uh, quickly and then we'll call it. Example, I don't even know what this is anymore. Eight, we've gotten through a lot today. Find the area of the part of this paraboloid that lies under z equals nine. OK, 
Okay, so again, just because we can sketch it, we should. Paraboloid. It's here at nine. And we're looking to find the area as we scoot around this thing. So, if we're going to use this, let's set it up so we have our kind of template here. So, df, or we can use z, dz dx squared plus dz dy squared, all da. So, we're going to need some inequalities. For uh, for D, we're going to need to be able to describe this region. So we should do that before we get into our uh, integrand. Okay, so let's think about D. What is D? Well, D is what sits beneath this whole thing if we integrate um, up. So D is really this disk here. And we know that we have an intersection of z equals 9 and z equals x squared plus y squared. And so this is really disk of radius 3. All right, so if we project the surface down into the xy plane, that's what we get. And so, you know, this thing would be um, nice to describe in polar coordinates instead of rectangular. That's not going to be that hard to do. So if we think about it like this. tells us that r spans between 0 and 3, theta between 0 and 2 pi. So then we've got our um, element set up for the limits and for my area piece. So now let's take a look at that integrand. Well, what is uh, dz dx squared and dz dy squared? Well, dz dx is really 2x. dz dy is really 2y. This becomes 2x squared, 2y squared. which is 1 plus 4x squared plus 4y squared. So maybe you can see here, this would be really nice to simplify. Because we know in polar world, x squared plus y squared is r squared. So we move into polar, and now we've got a full double integral that's completely set up to go. And in fact, since we've got um, our variables are completely independent, we can just split these off. and do them uh, separately here. So 
So it works out to be an exact form. It's this. But that is that. How we find surface area of a graph given in our kind of more commonplace rectangular notation of z equals f of x, y. It looks a lot like the arc length formula because it's very much a uh, three dimensional version of that. So that is where that comes from. All right, so leave it at that last step there for a moment. Any questions there? All right. Sounds good. So we will call it there. Hit the recording here.